Before your current roles, for which you're being celebrated, um, you've all had busy careers, and I'm wondering what would you say was the most difficult phase of your career until now? A difficult period, and why? Mm. Difficult phase? phase? Difficult phase. Not getting paid, <laughs> um, not working, and working and not getting paid, yeah. When was that specifically? Pick an indie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that uh, maybe it's because when when you think when you when you know you're talented, when you know you're good, you've you've been with really good people, um, and then you can't get arrested. That, that's, Actor jail. Yeah, they call that. I was doing a uh, uh, I was in a you know a tailspin, and I can I considered it to be a tailspin, and uh, I, I'll never forget I was um, on 87th and Broadway with my wife and we were talking about you know where my career was at and I was running out of money and and I had a, uh, a baby on the way and and all this kind of uh, stuff was happening and I broke down had a breakdown you know just an anxiety attack and I said I can't believe I'm doing a fucking movie about underground worms <laughs> <laughs> And I think that was probably a low point. I love that film. A, a low point, thank you. But that was a low point. That could be a bottom, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a very good story. Yeah, for me, I guess it was, uh, I mean, every career, it's peaks and valleys, and you go through a whole, you know, every time you finish a job, I think some of us have that uh, insecurity about will I ever work again? Well, you know, what the future is gonna hold. But, yeah, you know, for me during the, the 90s when you sort of make the transition from you know, being in your 30s and, and then sort of moving on to other roles. I think, I think actors, in, in a long career, you have to remake yourself in a certain, to a certain extent you know, uh, to make that transition. And that was, that was kind of rough for me during the 90s for a time. Did the rest of you go through that too, John? Um, I, I, I think the beginning was difficult. I, I think in the beginning I would just take jobs because they were there. And I was surprised that I got it in the first place. So I took, it, there was a period at which I had done s several jobs I probably shouldn't have done because they, they were offered to me before I realized, wait a minute, I don't have to do, I don't have to do this. I could, some, no, I wasn't getting very good advice. And, um, I had to realize it for myself the hard way, and so I kind of hit a wall where I thought, you know, I gotta step back here and, and, and make better choices. Um, and I think, to echo Dennis, I, I, you know, you go through sort of fallow periods, and um, I've hit those, and I didn't manage to get through it one way or another. Um, so, but, but probably that beginning period until I realized that I could, that I could and you know, you're, you're, you're not faced with a lot of choices in the beginning either. You sort of, that's what they give you and you, you, you take it or leave it. So getting to the period where I had some choices was difficult. It's interesting when you say choices because I, th I think we all, from the beginning, whether we believed it or not, had the right to make choices. But at times we, I certainly thought, I'll speak for myself, that, oh, listen to this person or that person in terms of career direction, I need to do this, I need to do that. It was against what I was feeling or what I was thinking. Uh, history, family history of money bullshit and you know how much money you should be, you know, economic concerns, et cetera. And I certainly made some choices along the right way that were not what I believed in, not what I wanted to do. And I usually got in trouble when I made those choices. But they also defined my life after the fact. And it, it reminds me of something when I was a kid. I had just done a Vita, and they flew me out to Zoetrope to meet Gene Kelly, who was going to do, I think, That's Entertainment 2 or something. And they were shooting with Raul and Terry Garr. Coppola was shooting One from the Heart. And it was this whole new thing with the technology and everything. So I remember I walked into the studio to meet Kelly. And uh, he sent me in this office and there's this 
there's this bald guy, a sort of chubby bald guy behind this massive desk, and I, I couldn't see where Kelly was. And slowly I realized that I was looking at Jane Kelly. Yeah. And somewhere in the conversation, as a kid, which I didn't remember this conversation till I'd made several mistakes years later, he said to me, let me tell you something, kid. Our successes never taught us anything. They pat you on the back and send you on your way. But our failures, we turned them upside down and inside out, and they gave us everything we ever had. So as, as anxiety-ridden as I was from some of my negative choices or choices that I didn't believe in, I don't know who I would have been without them. That's interesting. Did, did the rest of you have some point in your career that really taught you a lesson that kind of steered you one way or the other? Don't leave your wallet in the dressing room. That, that, <laughs> that kind of lesson. <laughs> something like that, except more you know, career-wise, you know, something that you either said, this was smart or this wasn't smart. I'll never do that again. Corey, how about you? I mean, I think, uh, you know, and, and without getting into any names, it's I think in general to not uh, assume other people's craziness. You know, I think uh, we all have our own craziness and we, we have to sort of maintain that. But I think I have, a, I have a constant need whenever I'm in a cast to sort of, you know, be friends with everybody and be a family. And uh, I think I've gotten in trouble sort of trying to, you know, let's be honest. Everybody be honest. And, and I don't know, sometimes... Yeah, or, or, or sometimes it works too well. Oh. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, the hard time in your career, like in terms of choices, I'm at that place now in my career where it's really the first time uh, I've had choices. And it, it's really interesting because I, I feel for the first time I have something to lose. You know, the, every, every uh, success I've had has surprised people. Nobody's like, who is that guy? You know, and, and I, that's a really great place to be. Well, there's no expectation, just, too. Yeah, and you can just be that character, and you can do the best job you can. If you're not good, then people don't pay attention to it. But if you're good, then you stand out. And uh, so now I'm at that place. It's, it, it's scary. But, but, I mean, obviously I'm not going to complain about it. It's the <laughs> champagneest problem in the world to have. But it's still, it's still you know, it's still a challenge. And how are you going about making decisions about what to do next with this kind of great entree that you've had for a lot of people as your first big, you know, TV role? Uh, just, just trying to follow my bliss, you know, just trying to, you know, do what I, I want to do, play those scenes I want to play and work with those people I want to work with and try not to be too strategic. It's hard because you have a million people around you telling you to be strategic. This job will lead to that. Um, but I think there's a danger that you can spend your entire career being strategic and just you know, trying to get the job that will get you the next job and sort of miss the job you're in. Uh, Am I right? I don't know. Yeah, I, just I, 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 I agree. I, heart. Dennis, uh, you know, longevity. I mean, I look around the room, and we're, there's a reason why we're all still fucking here, you know, and that we have enough talent to kind of beat the system. They can't kill us. We're like cockroaches. They can't. They can't. We're still here after decades. And I think there's, in a, in a business that doesn't care whether any of us are here on Tuesday, that we've lasted decades, and there's nobility and longevity. You look at the Jimmy Stewart's and the Spencer Tracy's and the Peter Sellers and all those guys, they lasted decades. And I think that's, um, that's a goal, you know? And what gets you there, you know, is that we're all good at what we do. I'm not saying we're the greatest thing we ever, that ever stepped in front of a camera, but we're good at what we do, and I think talent wins out, and, you know, just be that. good every time, but I, I agree, ups and downs, and, and there's, that's, that's the ride. I think, it all, <clears throat> I think it also has to do with having the fire in your belly for it yeah. and keeping that. You know, I know that I, 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 it really does get hard, because I know when I started out, I mean, all you want to do is you know, you're, you're doing it for free, basically, in acting class, because you want to be an actor, and you really want to find out what what that is to be in a character and the human condition is also fascinating and thrilling 
you know, I'm, I'm not even talking about the job part, I'm just talking about being an actor and having the fire in your belly for it. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough to have the success happen, and, and then it peaks, and then it goes, <laughs> and then it's where we have all these other things that come into play, you know, of, of, of having money in your life to, to be able to, to, to live and you know, raise a family and, you know, and, uh, and these career choices like you were talking about that are coming at you from all, all different kinds of places. Some of them pay for houses and reasons. kids. And, 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 and sometimes you yeah. find yourself, you know, I found myself at different points in my career where I'm going, where am I? How did I get here? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's tough to keep that, that original fire that you had for why you wanted to be an actor. And you really, you gotta, it has to be rekindled every once in a while. And I'm not sure how it happens, but it's just gotta be there. And uh, I, feel, I feel fortunate that it's, it's still there. I think it's also risk and failure, failure too. You were talking about you know the, the Gene Kelly and the failures, and that that keep yeah. the fires that you go into whatever, right. whether it's a little indie or a TV series or a play or whatever, music you know that you might fail at it gets you clicked in again. You know, yeah. fear is a great motivator. Fear is a great motivator. <laughs> what did you guys see as the biggest challenge in doing television for the first time? I think for me, uh, part of it was uh, switching directors. Um, you know, I, I had a great, um, uh, you know, watching Kira's thing on The Closer and then directing The Closer, I, I got a great education about it, sort of secondhand, you know, from her just seeing it, you know, and, and being there all the time. And she, I would see that she would sometimes get a little bit, uh, you know, shaken by the idea of somebody new. And I didn't really realize that that was going to, you know, affect me in the way that it did. You know, especially since I had directed television. So, so uh, it's, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard thing because, like, you know, you get maybe three or four days into like something, and and uh, you're starting to get a rhythm, you know, and you're starting to like have a, a shorthand with the guy, and then see ya. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, it's the same, you know, if you, you do a movie. I mean, you know, that's that that process of kind of trying to find a way that, you know, you can dance together. Right. And, and it's tough to, to get that. I mean, I guess you guys would, you know, we're in our first season, so I guess probably you tend to bring people back, you know, for the second in season, and then you already have a little bit of an idea of how they work, and it gets a little e easier. But I didn't expect that. What was the question? About the transition to TV and the most challenging Yeah, aspect. I was very defensive in the beginning because, uh, I didn't have, I didn't let myself trust the directors that I felt they're just coming in as guests, they're not part of the process from the beginning. I was uh, arrogant, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't trustful. What and did I, you do? And I, was, and I was pretty fucking insecure. And, uh, and I wouldn't listen to them. I would basically, I, I, I made, when I was doing Chicago Hope, I literally said, tell these people not to talk to me. Sure. And I really can't get over that I did that, that I had the nerve to do that. And the blessing of surviving and being 60 years old now and still getting the privilege to do this and getting some wisdom basically from, you know, being around guys like you and my kids who've grown up to be my teachers is, uh, is I learned to listen to them. And I learned that it really didn't matter and that I didn't have to be perfect, which I was never going to attain anyway. And, and I have this mantra, you know, now that I wished I'd had when I was a kid. Stop trying to be Superman. You know, be a team player. And, and I didn't know how to do that when I was a kid. I was an asshole. And, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to get an award for it today, but, <laughs> but I'm trying harder at it. And I listen to these guys, the ones that I know are instantly gifted. You know, you can just smell it. And the ones that I know aren't, I literally try to help them more. And it sort of takes the shit off my, my shoulders. And, and I'm just grateful that I just, you know, got there, that I lived long enough to sure. be not such a jerk. It's interesting to see that. I've been directing my show for the last couple of years, and the burden that you feel, not to be Superman, but to go, I got to get this, if I don't get this right, or if I fuck this up, yeah. 
you get a great piece of material and you think, I, gotta, I, I don't want to screw this up. You know, you put that pressure on yourself. Yeah. And then through the process of editing and watching and you just go, man, the burden is not, it's, a, it's so disseminated through the ranks. I mean, everybody has their, if it's any good, it's because of the collaboration of all these people yeah. and the DP and the, the designers and the, everybody and all the other actors. And, and so it really took that burden away. Yeah. And, and, and as you said, they never, you, no one ever uses a take from one, to, they take, they can do anything. They can yeah. cut somebody out of a frame yeah. that's good. They can take the dialogue from take one and put it in your mouth from we take seven or, and you, and you, right. and you, yeah, and you, and you, and you can, you can do anything and they'll, yeah. and they'll fix it. They'll make it better. They'll grab something from somewhere else. And it's just such a, it was such a relief. Yeah. It's, it's, it really took, uh, it made the process for me a lot easier. The television process, where, you're, where you, we are forced to trust someone that you don't necessarily trust, and, and they might come back. You know, like you said, they bring those directors back, and it's not because you like them so much. It's because <laughs> they finish on time, or they do whatever, and you're yeah, like, oh, there's a lot shit, of here comes this bozo again. Yeah. And you go, and you, so you find a way to yeah. navigate that. And you still have to give somebody options. You know, you still, if you do it the same way every time, then it's yeah. pointless. I saw Claire work with such a freedom that, you know, just encouraged me to take those kind of chances. And, and you say, jokingly, you say it took you six episodes. Somebody sent me the first episode where you made that long speech about, you oh, know, God, about yeah. the country. Well, I brought it to my wife. I sent it to my sons. I thought it was one of the singularly finest pieces of television on every single level, that I, television or film, any kind of thing I've ever seen. The writing, the way you delivered it, the way it was shot, the way it was directed, the other actors, and what those editors did. The editing on this show was amazing. It yeah. was amazing. And, Thanks, and and it was just extraordinary. And I and I just and it was I just went, God, I'm 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 working at a time when this kind of stuff is being done. And it's it's pretty humbling, you know? And and what was also very humbling was I know how good you are and I know how hard you work, but it wasn't just you. It was the time that that editor chose to let you sit there and stew while you clocked that room, before you talked, whether it was your choice or not. It was an amazing ensemble of effort. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty thrilling. And it, and it also said to me, it's not all on my shoulders when I'm yeah. in a scene. Yeah. I, I'm a, I don't know how many cameras you guys use, but we're two and three cameras at a time. And you give up. Oh, it's the medium. Oh, it's the close-up. Yeah. Oh, it's the and right. you just play yeah. to the person, and then you. I don't go to dailies. I don't go to Video Village. Yeah. I don't. I just. I wait six months and see how they assemble this, and that's when I learned that it's okay not to do the perfect take because they're going to use this and that and that, and they're going to be over here. They're going to be way behind the five hundred people in the auditorium when you thought you had that brilliant moment. Yeah, it, it's and you just go. It's you just give it to them. Yeah, yeah. That's what I. Th the thing about the series thing is there's no time, there's no rehearsal, none of that. You know that going in, and as somebody out of the theater, you go, "Where's the six weeks? Where's the?" You bail on that, and you go, "Here's what I think it is at seven in the morning." Give it to them. Yeah. Now here's well, take two. Here's another version. Here and you right. give it, give it, give it. I hope, I hope I gave you enough. Walk away. Yeah, that's our job. Give you as yeah. many choices yeah. as you can before yeah. the clock runs out. I'm, I'm guessing. I've been doing this a long time, but I'm guessing that this is it. Here it is. Yeah, it's yeah. so it's instinct. You know, it's like it's yeah. just it's just it's it's not preparation. It's instinct. Do you find do you find with the series thing? that you forget what the last episode was? Totally. Yeah. I, I forget what the last day was. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to reach a point, I mean, even when I'm doing films, it's like, uh, I, I can't tell you what we shot yesterday, and I don't know what we're doing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All I know is what we're doing today. And uh, it's, yeah. I mean, it's scary. For me, it's, well, I, I kind of like the place. I Hopefully the somebody truth. reminds you, by the way, this is the too second on my yeah. mind. I also tell the writers I don't want to know. I ask them not to tell me what's happening or what they have in mind. Uh, what's coming up? You yeah, I mean, I gotta, I gotta know seven to ten days before because I'm right. old and it takes me forever to learn the words. But I really don't want to know. And uh, it keeps me on edge. I, I don't know. Mandy doesn't know what's going to happen five seconds of my life. Why should this guy know? I, I'm saying I embrace that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm having fun. I ne and I never used to be that way. I was like, I need to know the whole arc. I've got to orchestrate this thing. Sure. It's in my hands. You know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it is, that is one of the difficult parts for me was, is getting used to uh, 
do it because we do an episode every eight days. And then, you know, I'll get the script for the next episode a, a couple, you know, about three or four days before we're going to do Lucky. The, ne the next yeah. three or four days. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. I'm not saying I get a chance to read it. Oh, I would kill for three or four days. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's you read the next episode and you're, all, you're still in the one that you're doing yeah. and, and it can get all, it can get all mixed up. And, uh, it, but it's like you're saying, you just, uh, you come to a place where you have to trust it and just, just dive right in yeah. and everybody's there to help you. That's one of the good things about doing a series too, is that this crew over such a, a long period of time and this, uh, in the whole group, the editors, everybody's there is really basically, a, you know, a family and, yeah. and, uh, help, helping each other along. So you do get that. And speaking on that topic, uh, knowing what's going to happen to your character, Corey, you had an interesting experience on your show this season. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be all spoilery, but uh, anyway, the, 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 my, I have a, uh, a distinct arc with a, with a beginning, middle, and end. Oh, because you, it, you could spoil it if they haven't watched it. That's right. Yeah, right. I was going to say, but it's already there, so. Uh, I said, but I get it. But that's yeah. very kind that of you to not. When we, we had Bo Willimon on the showrunner roundtable, yeah. he said that wasn't supposed to be you. They, were, they initially had another character in mind to run for governor. Right. And that they liked you so much that they just said, screw that, let's just have this guy do the whole thing. Yes, I, I, I really And at what point did they that, communicate yeah. that to you? Like, this is the direction we're taking... Correct. Well, it was still the same basic arc. It was just fuller. You know, there was like I, uh, my character was still supposed to have this this incredible sort of journey, but they just gave me more to lose as I as I went along. You know, they made they 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 made my peak higher uh, on my way down. Um, but I actually, I, I, in my experience, it's the it's the closest thing to theater. I mean, it's a lot closer to theater than than, than film is because I had six and a half months to to marinate in this character and to be on these sets that we kept on returning to. And I knew, you know, I, I knew my, my scene partners and, and, uh, and that was an incredible opportunity. I mean, it, it's, it, this was a, a, a specific kind of thing because they had, they had all 13 episodes pretty much written before we started, which is an incredible uh, luxury. So it's almost sort of like a hybrid, but I felt more capable doing this than I have on a, on a film set. It seems, you know, coming from theater, it seems like my skill sets and, and uh, my experience was, was better suited to that. Actually. Are you guys good at predicting what the reaction is going to be to your work? When you're making it, do you say, okay, this is good, this is the one that everyone's going to respond to, or like on your show, this is going to be politically divisive and people are going to attack and people are going to defend? Do you, do you have a good track record on predicting the reaction of your own, to your own work? I don't really care. Um, I, I don't. I, 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 there's, well, there's good, and I think we all walk away from the set knowing that what we did was good. So I, we, I don't need anyone to tell me whether it's good or not. I already know that. And how they cut it, how they put it together. You know, we've been doing this a long time. How they react to it is, um, you know, I, some are going to love it, some are going to hate it. No matter whether it's political, like Aaron's show or or whatever, they're just they're just not going to like. Some people won't like it. Some will. I, I, you know, I hope enough do this so that they have it. But I, I, I invest no effort in it emotionally at all. Anyone else? Uh, no, I. I sort of feel the same way. I mean, there are people that would go, oh, this is going to be, boy, this is going to make a big splash. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it doesn't matter, and it never really is, no one ever gets it really right. Uh, but no, I... What I, was the experience on Mad Men that first season? Um, it, it, uh, it, 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 it took off, it took a, a I mean, we, we shot a pilot, and then we waited a year and a half, and then we... You know, we were, we, it was a, a network that had never made any, anything, and, and um, we knew the material was good, but sort of figured nobody would ever see it. And, uh, you know, and didn't really care. I mean, I, 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 the, the, the part I had in the pilot was not, not um, as, certainly as well developed as it's become, and so I didn't have that much invested in it. Um, 
And it came at a time when DVR and being able to collect shows sort of hit so you people could start it from the beginning, which I think makes it easier for all these shows for people to say, oh, I, the, you know, House of Cards is incredible. Have you seen it? And you can start from page one. You can go home and one. watch the entire season. Whereas that before, way. you'd have to be, you'd be in the middle of someone and you'd go, you know, the hell with it. I don't know what's going on and I don't care. So that kind of happened at the same time. And, and it, it, you know, it was, it's, it's, what, it's what you want. I mean, you want to be involved in something that people want to watch. So it was a it's positive completely experience. out of your control, though. It totally is. It really, it really is. is. I'm glad. I'm glad people like it. I'm glad. I, I'm glad I like it. You know, it rarely happens where you get something that you like, that you know is good material. It's well, and then it's and then further, it's well executed. You know, sometimes you get a good script and it, it just isn't that well put together, and for whatever reason, no one ever sees it, <clears throat> or the opposite. You're doing something that you just did for the money, and that becomes a big deal, and you're like, oh, great. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really the truth. I mean, you, it's, you really have nothing to do with it after you've done no. it. I mean, you have your reasons for, for doing a role right. and, or for, for taking on a project, but whether it be film, movies, or, or, or theater, television, it's, it's, uh, you have to release it because you, have to, you just don't have any control over, you know, your movie's coming out and the stock market crashes the day before, or there's a you know there's a hurricane, or there's this, or it just doesn't happen to uh, hit what what it was supposed to hit. You just have no control, or it's it's um, you know it's success for reasons you never thought of either. So just you just never know. You like it comes back control. to the doing it. Yeah, between exactly. action and cut, that's what I. As soon as I'm done with that, I, I'm already letting it go. Or that's that's the payoff for me is when there's a great day, you know. And it's one of the things about television is so amazing is that you get a chance to just act and act and yeah. act and act. You know, you do a comic book movie, you spend eight months, and it's like the amount of time you're acting is like an infinitesimal part of your life, you know. And I think we all really like to act. Yeah, and it's not boring. It yeah, television. it's like you, you get do not go, get bored. Holy shit! I've been here, whatever, sixteen hours. We've done nine pages, ten pages. Yeah. You go, ah, it's exhilarating. You yeah. know. What are you um, most critical of when you watch yourself perform? When you watch, yeah, when you watch your shows, or when you watch movies you've done, what is what is the thing you pick up on that most critical of? <laughs> uh, I'd say you know. Bad habits, you know, things that I go, well, I pulled that, you know, I did that thing. I've done that before, you know, I, I didn't quite, um, I didn't quite investigate that enough. Um, I went to, a, I went to like a go-to kind of thing. Maybe I should uh, start to question, you know, that stuff again, you know, that stuff that we all you know, could kind of start out with, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the figuring out what you want, you know, out of a scene and, and talking to people and listening to people and, you know, really asking for the salt. Mine is doing too much. I always do too much. What does that mean? I'm over the top. I'm like the president of the club. <laughs> but actually, on your show, you're you're the smallest. A good editor. You're so, but you're so you're so small on on home. You're restrained you're so, on home. That, I tell you, you don't know what they cut out. I owe those editors and Alex Gans and the team everything. I'm not. It's kidding. the great thing about that about that 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 character. It's yeah. just so it's so small. I don't know how it gets like that in the final version. <laughs> So do you always do a small one? Do you always, if you go over well, the top, do you I remind only, yourself I, to do a small yes, one? Yes, and I said to Alex Gonza and Howard Gordon, I said, I promise you before I leave any take that I'll take the size down. Before I take it, leave any angle. <laughs> before I leave any angle that I'll make sure that, you know, it's not a Mandy take, that it's... Uh, it's <laughs> I want to see the homeland where you're bigger than you. Love to see that. I owe those editors everything. You know? But, you know, when you were saying earlier about... Uh, um, inevitably, I, I, I just, it, letting go is like just the greatest because, and, and not easy. It's not like, you know, oh, here's how you do it. I don't know how you do it. But inevitably, if I think that, w I, you know, I, I hit it, I hit it, I hit it, thank God I hit it. And then if I sometimes will see it or I'll look, you know, or I'll, I'll look at some dailies for whatever, which is very rare, 
the one, oftentimes when I think I hit it, I didn't. And what I thought was horrible and would beg you to reshoot it or beg, you know, for the time to redo it, it I was nuts. You know, it, it, it's, I just finally, I've realized, and that's from surviving, that I just don't know and I don't need to know and just forget about it. Just shut up and keep swimming, you know? Yeah. How, oh, how about the rest of you? Do you have any particular things you watch in yourself when you're performing that you wish you could tweak or change? I, I had that same thing that you have, that was just like, you know, the go big thing. So it's a, that's the reason I appreciate strong directors who have a definite point of view, somebody to sort of rein me in. And I always tell them the same thing. Look, I'm going I'm to do this. Just like, please just kind of hold me back. And it's usually the one where I feel like I'm doing nothing. Mm -hmm. That is the, the one that works. I don't really have a, I've gotten a, a kind of immune to looking at myself on film or TV or anything. And, uh, but uh, uh, at, at the same time, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is about letting go and just trusting it. I find it, I find it myself often, it's the transition from one, you know, one action to another. It's, it's, it's the, you know, you can, often in myself, I can see the seams. I can see like, okay, this actor is making a choice now. And that's always when I'm sort of. So try not to give away too much. Well, just you, when you can, whenever you can see somebody acting and I can, and I've made all those choices. So I know that I acted. And so that's kind of like a horrible thing to watch. Uh, all right. Story time. Worst auditions. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> few of them. Oh, I got a really bad one. <laughs> I just thought of this. Uh, so it's probably, I don't know, maybe it's Studio 54 is, is just about to close or was about, just about to close. And I used to go to 54 in the 70s. And, uh, you know, I wasn't famous. I mean, I was, you know, a waiter. And, uh, but I found a way to get in and uh, how, how, shoes. how did you get yeah, I had to have the right shoes on. <laughs> okay. Because uh, uh, Rubel would come over and there was a rope and he'd, you know, look down and see what kind of shoes you had on. So, uh, <laughs> Especially if you were a cute young man, too. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it was the shoes. Uh, and um, I used to go by myself, but that's a whole other thing. And so... My agent called me up and said, no, you don't go up for uh, musicals. But there is a musical called Got to Go Disco. <laughs> and it's based on Studio 54. In, in fact, this guy, the guy that was one of the guys at the, at, the, uh, you know, at the club that would let you in was a guy named Mark. And when people would arrive at 54, they'd go, Mark, Mark, two, Mark, two, Mark. They'd start screaming at Mark. And he would let people in or not let people in. He had blonde hair. And, uh, he was very, very scary, dude. Like, t like everyone was terrified of him. So Mark was one of the producers on this musical about '54 called "Got to Go Disco." They said, "I know you, you know you're not a musical guy, but but you know it's all you got to do is sing a disco song." <laughs> so I said, "All right." So I got uh, Alicia Bridges' "I Love the Nightlife." Um, I was probably about 18 or something like that, and I started working on this song, "I Love the Nightlife." just off the record. Uh, I never got the sheet music. I didn't realize that you had to have sheet music. Uh, so I finally called up and I said, well, I, I've, been sing I've been singing with the record. And they said, well, you gotta get sheet music. So I went to uh, uh, Colony Records there on, on, uh, on 50th Broadway, got the sheet music for I Love the Nightlife. Went into the audition and it was in a key not even close <laughs> to it. Because I was singing an octave up from Alicia Bridges, right? But the sheet music was like in a completely different. And I started off, the guy started talking, like, please don't talk. And I was like, way, way, way out of my range. And sitting it there. sounded pretty good, actually. What? So far, so good. <laughs> sitting there was Mark, and he was like, and I just, I stopped it. I stopped the audition. I went down on my knees, and I said, this is, this is terrible. I never should have been here. I'm so sorry to waste your time. And I walked out. That was it. Did he ever let you in the studio 54 again? 54 had, had, I think, just closed, but probably he wouldn't have let me in. I got that part. You did. <laughs> <laughs> and it ran for... I, I'm pretty sure it made my career. It was, it was your key. 
first of all, first and foremost. <laughs> right, that's pretty good. Other stories? I, uh, I um, Oklahoma on Broadway, um, went in, auditioned. Again, didn't know about sheet music. I knew I had to bring some, so I, I typed out the words to uh, Corn is as high as an elephant's eye, whatever that song is, and put guitar chords over the top. G to the C to the D7 to the... And I was there, and it was my one and only musical audition on Broadway, and I got there, and it was all the cliches, and the guy before me was doing Cagney's Yankee Doodle Dandy as his audition, and he literally danced up the side of the proscenium like Cagney did in the movie. He was, he was amazing. And I'm there in a flannel shirt with some lyrics typed out. With, I handed it to the piano player. He looked at it. He waved the thing. And then I started singing, and I knew it wasn't going well, so I started to dance a little bit, started to move <laughs> back and forth and looked at the proscenium and by that point they go, nah, nah, thank you. I, I, was, I think they cut me off when I looked at the proscenium. That was horrible. It was just horrible. The only musical I ever auditioned for. How about any movie auditions? Dennis, I'm sure you have a couple. Um, mine was a musical audition as well. It was, <laughs> it was always the worst because it was, <clears throat> it was the Pirates of Penzance. And uh, remember coming out for LA for it and going in and that's tricky. It was music a whole too, yeah. yeah it was yeah. It, you know, I thought I'd worked on it, but you know, it just really was outside of my completely outside of my wheelhouse. And uh, just remember doing about that same thing, you know, singing the song and uh, knowing I it wasn't hitting those. It's, it's really difficult music and and. Uh, and there's a certain, I think there's a certain voice that also goes with, with Broadway, which doesn't really, I mean, I sing rock and roll and blues, and, and bas basically, and, uh, and there was dancing that went along with it, and, and a sword <laughs> in my head. That uh, was, it was very awkward, and, uh, and I was told, uh, basically, that that was pretty abysmal <laughs> afterwards, so. Uh, that, that was the worst. Have any of you done anything crazy to win a role? I died my, I, I got a call to play Sylvester Stallone's brother in a movie. And the audition was in like an hour. And I was like, but they need you to dye your hair black. And I said, okay, good. And I was at my sister's house. I didn't even have an apartment. I was living at my sister's apartment. And I didn't have any money. I, went, to, I took, went into her drawer, I got the laundry quarters, I got all the quarters, I went to the drugstore and I got some hair dye shit that you, you know, put in your hair with like the little gloves and you put like the bonnet on your head. I remember as I was leaving the house, there was a bunch of guys digging a trench in the street and I went to the drugstore and I got this black, like Clairol hair dye and went back, <laughs> put it in my, in my hair and it's like, you know, it's like tar and I, uh, and then I go to turn the water on, and that, the thing kind of goes, gah, 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 and I, and I realized that the guys digging in the trench in the road had <laughs> shut the water off to the building, <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, I got Oh my god! So I, I went into the refrigerator, and I'm, I'm thinking I could stick my head in the toilet. I'm, oh I'm, I'm not that desperate. God. And I, I went, and I got it was a, like a couple of bottles of water, like club soda. And I took off all my clothes and I put the water, you know, poured out the like half liter bottle of, and now this shit is all over me. And I'm like, and it's also about 111 degrees in Manhattan. What movie was this for? It was for a movie called Gangster that I don't, that never got made. And I, and I, uh, I got the stuff off of my face and head sufficiently to put clothes on and go to this thing, literally this shit is dripping down, I'm like dripping down the side, I look like, I look like a, a, an anemic vampire, you know, I mean, it, it's, I'm, and I went, and I did this audition with this casting person who was, the scene was, the scene was, I was like the jittery, sort of coke-addled brother of Stallone, he was always getting the guy out of jams, and I mean, it's no wonder this movie, I've never got made, but, so there was a scene where, he, oh my God, where the guy was going to have to, I, some, where some gangster was going to make him get on his knees 
And I don't know what he was going to, I forget why, but he had to get, make the guy get on his knees. And this casting director had come around the desk and she was fully into the scene and playing the scene. And I'm, you know, wiping the hair dye off my face. I'm on my knees going, no, Charlie, no. And, I'm thinking, and I had a complete out of body experience thinking, what the fuck? Are you, I saw myself on my knees wiping the hair dye off my face with this casting director yelling at me. And I thought, and I just, clearly I didn't get the part. The movie never got made. I probably, I was probably the reason the movie never got made. The audition was so bad. I was, uh, it was my first audition in LA uh, for a, an episode of CSI. It was just like a one scene thing, but I was like, I got this audition. I was so excited. It was to play like this clerk in a porn store. And, uh, and so I went to this, uh, this place, Rough Trade on Sunset in, uh, in Silver Lake. That uh, you know, it's like this like leather clothing store, and and went in there and, and explained to the uh, the clerk the uh, that uh, you know I was auditioning for this thing, and he didn't he thought that I was just uh, too embarrassed to you know say that I just was a leather daddy, and <laughs> and I had also actually I had just been playing uh, uh, this. Orthodox Jewish man, so I had this full beard, but I had just shaved it into a, into a, a handlebar mustache to prepare for this, this audition. Uh, so after... Uh, so you, just, had, you had payas and a handlebar mustache. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get the picture here. That, that I should have done. Um, but, and I was just too polite to, you know, to, to sort of keep him away, but he was... He was he, had, he he was really excited. He got me all dressed up, and uh, and uh, it was a little too expensive. So uh, I wound up just with a, a tight little crop top. <laughs> so you wore that. So you wore that to yeah, the audition. Sure. I did. I did. Wow. A little sparkly crop top. You can get a lot of that stuff cheaper on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> My worst moment. Still, Juliet Taylor, yeah. one of the great casting directors in New York. I was second year in New York or something, and the agent got me in to just meet her. This is great. Now, I'd heard you should lie on your resume. That you should, if you don't have a lot of training, just put a bunch of training. And Sanford Meisner, Sandy Meisner, who was one of the great te acting teachers, you know, he was terrific at Neighborhood Playhouse, put him down there, you know. <laughs> That's just, you know, Sandy Meisner, Sandy, you know. And so she's looking through the resume, and she goes, uh, you've done this, you've done that, yeah. I see you've studied with Sandy Meisner. I said, yeah, she was great. <laughs> and Juliet looked at me, and then just kept right on going, and then later told me, yeah, it was great. She asked me about Sandy Meisner and how great she was. He's, he's a man. What are you doing? Okay. I'm going, fuck me. <laughs> oh, my God. I have yet to talk to her about it. <laughs> Did she ever cast you in anything after that? She did. She did. She forgave me far. I mean, I haven't forgiven myself yet. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. What, what single role do you think most changed you as an actor or became a turning point for sort of maybe your craft evolving or represented a real milestone for you? Well, I, for me, it was uh, breaking away that uh, when that came along, because I'd been at that point, I'd been going from uh, job to job to job just to try to get a job. And I, I remember I actually had a job. Uh, it was a it was a film with Lee Majors about doing you know working high rise construction, and um, I was happy to have it. I don't think it got made or if it did get made, I, whatever. But uh, along at the same time. Uh, b b b Right about the same time, came along and auditioned for for Breaking Away, and I went in to read and see Peter Yates, and uh, for some reason, thank God for Peter Yates, and and because I, I don't think I would have had the career if if, if it wasn't for him, he uh, he just like offered me the role when it first came in, and that had never happened to me before. And I said, I'd like to, I'd love to, but I, I already have this job. And he actually got in the doorway and blocked my way. I said, listen, young man, you have to do this. You have to do this. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, at, uh, and uh, wound up doing the movie. And 
he really taught me about film acting, what about, what, about what it was, about just being. You know, he chose me because of, of I was already the guy in a way that looked and sounded like the guy. That it really was, you know, there the, was the, not to do, but he, he taught me how to be small and how to be still. And, uh, and, you know, because I'd come from university theater, and, you know, and it was, and uh, he was like, he was, a, he was a great mentor and father, Peter Yates, to all of us. And uh, what a great director. And he was. Thank God for him. But that, that role sort of changed everything that, uh, from going from job to job to, we were talking about having, having choices finally in, in your career. For me, it was uh, Sunday in the Park with George, uh, uh, Steve Sondheim, and James Lapine's piece. Um, I was quite terrified. I was never a good auditioner. Um, I had just won a Tony Award for a Vita, and then Lapine comes over to my house and says, I have to audition for Sondheim. And I th said, well, why? I mean, don't you get anything for winning one of these awards? <laughs> I'm not a good auditioner. It's going to be a disaster. And then Steve called me up and said, everybody auditions for me except Angela, who I've worked with several times. So I go in. I'm a nervous wreck. And I end up getting it. And, uh, and he hated tenors, I heard, from Paul Gemignani. So, so anyway, I go in. I end up getting it. And then they also didn't have the part of the artist written. Uh, they, he, they created, they, I remember James said to me, I want, we want to create a work of art based on a work of art. So they chose the painting Sunday afternoon the, on the ground shot. And he wrote all the characters in the painting first. And, the, and, the, and then they realized there was a character missing who was the artist. So they wrote the artist last. So I would go through six weeks of rehearsal just drawing and doing nothing while everyone else did their thing. But within that piece were the repetitive words, connect, George, yes. connect. And those became... Uh, that's what I want on my tombstone. He tried to connect. Uh, that is what I live my life to try to do. And it also s introduced me to Stephen's work, Sondheim's work, and it became my life. Uh, I'm not a writer. If I could write, I would write every word he says. But his writing and his world is about turning darkness into light. Uh, and that is what my need is, to turn my darkness into light. And it, uh, he gave me the gift of my life. Uh, and so I don't know what I would have done without that. Wow. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a pivotal role? I, I tell you what was pivotal for me was a decision that Jeff made. Because I wondered if you were bring this up. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff was doing a play called Lemon Sky off Broadway. And uh, Cynthia Nixon was also in the, in the play. And they wanted to shoot it for PBS, for public television, for um, American Playhouse. And they offered both of them the parts. And they turned them both down. And my wife took Cynthia's part. And I took Jeff's part. So I really have him to thank for my marriage. So it wasn't really exactly a decision, of, a career decision of mine, it was more a career decision of his that was pivotal for me. Was I invited to the wedding? <laughs> <laughs> I was not. All right, I'm so very I, happy to I hear mean, that. I, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I, uh, Peter Russo in, in, in House of Cards is, it, it, I mean, it's weird to say that because I haven't really done much since, but um, uh, it, it, for me, uh, it was the most complete person I've ever played. You know, I mean, and to have that much material, uh, and, you know, and to be to have that those kinds of highs and those kinds of lows, to to be that ugly, to have the opportunity to be that ugly and to not have to uh, please the audience. You know, I mean, I think that's one of my worst habits is that I I, I want everybody to like me, and I that, you know, when I see that in in uh, in my own work, I, I know that I'm I'm cutting off the edges. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't allowed to do that with this character, um, and and yet there was also this sort of sublime, uh, you know, reaching for something. So, uh, you know, time will tell how, how pivotal it is in terms of my own development, um, but in terms of what I was able to to bring to the table, I've never been able to do 
that much in, in one role. All right, different question, lighter question. Um, oddest or most interesting fan interaction you've ever had? <laughs> Kevin, you smiled. Uh, yeah, I, it, 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 well, it happened, it was actually a, a thing with, uh, with, our, with our band. Uh, there was a woman who um, was a big fan and who had, unfortunately, uh, one of her legs amputated. Uh, she had, um, I'm trying to think what it was, maybe a diabetes thing or something, I'm not, not exactly sure. And uh, wrote to us and uh, said, you know, this song really got me through a lot of the tough times in, in my life. And she was coming to a show and wanted us to autograph her you know, uh, uh, prosthesis, yeah. Hmm, interesting. You, you must have interactions all the time about the six degrees thing. People, yeah, people, yeah, people on the subway will go, hey, one degree. <laughs> you know, that's, you know. Well, we're now all included, aren't we? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I've lost track of how you actually play this game. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to really. How about the others? Interesting fan interactions. Well, I get, especially on New York, I get, I've, I've had people, it was like, I guess during, especially during the 90s, we'd come up and say, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Bacon, how are you? And they met, they actually met Kevin Costner. They thought it was right. Kevin Costner. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would get. It's only that. one letter I'd get that, and I would also be Patrick Swayze. Oh, and, God, yeah. um, I had a kid in my yeah. own town walk up and go, excuse me, Mr. Bridges, you know? Yeah, and you try to talk them out of it. <laughs> Best wishes, Jeff, Jeff Bridges. Bridges, there you go. Do you find that people associate you with one specific movie, one specific role more than any, or is it just sort of, you're celebrated for? Depends on the demographic, I find. Okay. Like where you are, what people, you know, different parts of the country and, and age and all that kind of stuff. So in the Midwest, in towns that don't dance, clearly <laughs> there's a specific association. I find that once you've sat on a toilet in front of millions and millions and millions and millions of people. I change the way I go to the bathroom from that scene. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the more educational things I'd ever witnessed. Thank you. Hey, uh, <laughs> well, Mandy, I've heard you say you still get the Princess Bride stuff a lot. I'd say at least two to three times a day, and uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't be happier about it. You know, I, I um, you know, I pinch myself. I, I don't know how I ended up in something that became like what that was. And uh, I get my biggest kick when little kids come up, and I, I don't think I look like that guy anymore. And uh, and their parents are going, "This is so and so." And so I always go up to the little kid and I whisper in his ear the line and. Uh, to, um, but you know, it's, it's a funny thing when we're in certain things as we're younger, and I guess because people know that movie well, and many people quote every line from the film. It's, I was 20, no, I was, I, was, I was 34 when I made it. And there's the repetitive line, hello, my name is Anu, that you say over and over again. And then a few years ago, I was in Philadelphia on the elliptical running my lyrics for a concert. And the TV was on one of the machines, and there was the movie, but I wasn't listening because I needed to run my lyrics so that when I screwed up that evening in the concert, it wouldn't be because I didn't try to remember <laughs> earlier. I went up to the hotel room to have my dinner, and my wife was watching the end of the film. And, uh, and please forgive me if some of these things sound, you know, rabbinical or heavy. I, I guess that's what I've become, but I, I apologize. But, but, it, it, but it was that way for me. And, and the end of the film was on, and it was where Inigo was in the door, in the window, and Robin had just jumped out into Andre's arms, and the man in black says to Inigo, you know, invites him to become the next Dread Pirate Roberts. And this 34-year-old Mandy who said the line never really realized what I was saying. And, and then in my late 50s, I heard this line that to me really became the real cornerstone line for at least my character in that film and very much of my life. And the line was, you know, I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, 
I do not know what to do with the rest of my life. And, and that, to me, is the line that mattered to me. And it was so interesting to me that that kid never had any, who said that line, didn't, mm. didn't hear it. Didn't hear it, yeah. You know. One quick fan story just came up recently. Someone came up to me and said, you get a lot of, at this point, uh, a lot of comments on whether you look better or whatever or worse or you know there's a lot of like stuff you know if someone said well, this is a size someone said how did they make you look so bad on your show <laughs> and I said I got news for you honey they're trying their best to make me look good you got a, exactly the opposite this woman came up to me and she said oh my god you look so much better in person than you do in real life <laughs> what does that mean I don't know <laughs> I walked away and I went I, I get that too. I say, so do you. Yeah. Term of endearment. You were younger. <laughs> yes, so were you. I have a question for you guys. If if uh, if you're talking to a group of um, you know younger people who are going into the game, uh, and really want to know from you, what can you tell me to? Not, not to encourage me that you know, this young person's decided this is what they want to do, but what, what is it that you would offer them uh, if, if this was your last day on earth, that, that you feel this uh, it synthesizes down to this, uh, that you know, if I could give it to you in a pill or give my kid this in a pill, what would it be that you would offer? And not necessarily in the business, even you know, just to our kids or to you know, young people who want to go in the business. Uh, what is it that you feel you've you've gotten for getting being alive still? I tell them go get good. I tell college kids that I'm sure you guys talk to college kids. You get these kids that everybody's instant gratification now anyway. They want to be a star. No, no, no. Go, go be the best possible actor you can be, and the star shit will happen and come and go if you're lucky. But you, the only thing you can control is how good you are. So go get good. Mm -hmm. And again, longevity, I'm still learning stuff. You know, It's a cliche, but it's true. And if you're open to that, then great. But you got to go get good and, and um, you know, come back in five years. And then, you know, but you aren't good enough yet. Mm -hmm. Go get good. Do you think young people sort of bristle at that kind of advice? Like they don't, don't want to. Really they don't want to have they, to. They, I think good. most, especially today's gen. I got three twenty-somethings. Um, they need to hear it. I think this, gen, you know, this generation needs to hear it. Go do the work. Go get good out of the spotlight, away from, you know, fame. I don't know. Right? That's, Wrong? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that's the way. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough. I. Have, I have, it was my advice to my older son, who's you know an actor now too, and he just has it in him to want to 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 do the training and get trained as an actor. And it's it's really important for an actor to have that place where you're learning your craft, where you can fall flat on your face and fail. That and you know, and it's not in front of the entire world, even though it's still very humiliating. But but that's the only way that you learn is. Through, through your failures and uh, to have a place to really learn a craft. And uh, I do find that time has gone on now and I guess it's the nature of our society the way that's come that everybody just thinks that it's about being a star instead of, uh, well, not everyone, but a good, uh, a good portion. <laughs> one, uh, one thing, and we're going to have to wrap up soon. If, if you guys could run a television network for a day or for a week, what's the first thing you would change? I would, I would let the creators make creative decisions. I mean, I think, I think different networks and different cable, you know, I, it, my experience with Netflix you know, I, I think it was their first thing, so I think they were, you know, they, they and they had, you know, uh, so, you know, some big names uh, producing it, and so they, they were really hands off, and I think, uh, I, I, you know, when you're when you're in the trenches, when you're 
when you're the people who, who have a stake in, in, in the show you know, most closely, you are probably, and, and you dedicated your life to the, you know, the, this sort of fractal uh, understanding of how to make this scene work, you're gonna do a better job than, uh, than, than somebody who's, who's, who's thinking about uh, advertising, I would, I would think. And, uh, and, and I would think that, that you would, you know, just like a good director casts, you know, spends, you know, most of their time with the, you know, their, their job in acting is to cast well and then, you know, let the actors do their thing. I would think in a network it would be the same thing. You know, you know get good material, get, get great people, and then let them do their thing. I would like to see... It's not my um, millions. Sorry. I, I would like to see uh, the, the Showtimes and the HBOs and the FXs and all the cable networks find a way to get their extraordinary products that they are making today out to people who cannot afford premium TV. And I understand the niche that it is for people who can afford it, uh, but we who are doing it are absolutely taking a pay cut and we're still getting paid more than we deserve in my opinion, but we're taking a pay cut to what you make on successful network uh, syndicated etc. But um, I want the poorest people in this country to have the finest that we can possibly create. And that is not how it is set up at the moment. And I think that's a problem. And I don't have the solution because I've had discussions with people. But it doesn't have to be a five or six year waiting period till these people get it delivered to them. It can be maybe one year later while it's still in the consciousness and maybe they won't make quite as much money, but I don't, everything doesn't have to be about that bottom line dollar figure. And uh, they'll still have more money than they need to. And so I, I wish that this extraordinary stuff that's being made by television today is available to everyone. Well, and Netflix is that compromise, perhaps. Maybe it, you know, twenty dollars a month is a far cry from, you know, most of us pay. Yeah, and Hulu. I think they're getting there. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with Mandy. I really do. I think they're getting there. I'd love to see, you know. But we're we're working. Everybody have access. Yeah, right? we're 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 proud of what we're doing, and and there's some people who who are my friends that can't afford twelve, fourteen, fifteen dollars a month, yeah. and uh, we're bootlegging them copies because you know we're friends. You know, and that's and, and I don't want it to be that way, and so I don't have the solution, but I would like it found. Hmm. How about the rest of you? How about the network guys, Dennis and Kevin? <laughs> well, I would, first off, I wouldn't know the first thing about running a network. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing to admit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is, and uh, uh, you know, I think Les Moonves is really good at, and you know, Tess, are, are, our tests are really good at running. You know the network, but they're also that's a different world. It's a completely different job, a completely different mindset. That you know because uh, it it is uh, it is tied to the corporate world and it is tied to advertising and it is tied to uh, also trying to create good product and uh, and uh, so it's to, to step into that is. Is, is tough. I mean, certainly as you know, as a as an actor and, and, and as a just you you know you fight for the creative part and uh, of that, and you're allowed to do that. But it's still, I mean, even the network people are still part of that that team that that is putting everything together. And hopefully, it, you know, it all works out. And sometimes it does really great, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's, it's just a big boy game, and. Uh, you, uh... But see, I'm grateful for reality TV. I'm not against it because I feel reality TV can somehow foot the bill for these other things yeah. or other things that exist that um, I think there are other ways to skin the cat so that everybody can afford everything. 